Hi everybody. Today I'm going to be discussing the Precambrian Eon. So this is the first video lecture that will go over specific times in Earth's history, starting with the Precambrian, then after this we'll move on to the Paleozoic, and then the Mesozoic, and then the Cenozoic. And we'll try and talk about all the key events that occurred in each of those periods in Earth's history. However, I must stress that so much time went by in each one of these time periods that it would be impossible to talk about every single thing that happened. So I'm just going to hit at least what I and the textbook I'm using uh, feels is important. And if I miss anything that's super important, I will make another video about it later on. So let's get started. First, I just want to point out when the Precambrian was. Like I said, this is the first Earth history video we're going to do about a specific time in Earth's history. So the Precambrian probably marks the earliest time in Earth history, which it does. The Precambrian went from around 4.5 billion years ago, which is what GA means, and to about 542 million years ago, or MA, uh, which is when the Paleozoic began. So we're just going to be talking about the Precambrian today. So within this time range, and it includes eras Hadean, Archean, and Proterozoic. So before we start with the Hadean, I just want to point out how large a time interval the Precambrian really was. If we look at this time scale, we can see that the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic past 542 million years was actually only about 10% of all Earth's history, but the Precambrian was almost 90% of Earth's history. Even though it seems like the Precambrian was a very different Earth than today, it does represent what Earth has been like for most of its life. So let's get started. Starting with the Hadean, which I just went to a workshop where people were calling it the Hadean rather than Hadean, and now I'm questioning all of my life choices, so I'm a little worried <laughs> I'm mispronouncing it. So you might hear me switching back and forth between Hadean and Hadean throughout this video just to make sure I hit all the bases. So this eon went from 4.6 to around 4 billion years ago, Basically, Earth formed because heavy elements such as iron, magnesium, and silicon collided and accreted to form Earth around 4.6 billion years ago. And if you want more information about how this occurred, as well as how other planets in the solar system formed, you can watch my Origin of the Solar System and the Moon video, which is the lecture just before this one. And once Earth formed, it was very hot and molten during the Hadean. This is because of three main contributors of heat, such as heavy bombardment, gravitational compression from formation, and radioactive decay of isotopes. But as Earth cooled, it went through a process called differentiation. So once bombardment started to slow down and gravitational compression started waning and radioactive decay started to slow as well, Earth began to cool down. However, it cooled slowly enough for differentiation to occur. This differentiation is basically the formation of Earth's interior layers. What happened was the denser elements sank to Earth's core while the less dense elements rose to the surface forming the heavy, dense iron core that we have, and the lighter, less dense, silicate-rich upper mantle and crust that we have. And you can see that in this image to the left, denser material in the inner and outer core, and less dense material in the mantle and crust. Additionally, the formation of the liquid outer core, although still dense and iron-rich, this layer is liquid, which is why it caused the formation of the magnetosphere, which protects us from harmful solar radiation and solar wind. During the Hittian, the atmosphere was formed as well and this occurred by way of outgassing. So all this means is that volcanoes were very active because the Earth was very hot, and this activity of volcanoes released a lot of gases into the atmosphere. These gases included carbon dioxide, water vapor, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, methane, and ammonium. These gases made up early Earth's atmosphere. And you can tell there's probably something different about this atmospheric composition than today's, and that is there's no oxygen. And just so you know, I say no oxygen, but take that with a grain of salt, uh, basically negligible oxygen, if any, it was very little. And we'll get back to oxygen later when we talk about the late Archean and Proterozoic. So hold on to that thought uh, and we'll get back to atmospheric composition. But first, 
let's discuss a little bit more about what happened in the Hadean, such as crustal formation. We had oceanic crust form first. However, this oceanic crust was very different than today's crust. What happened was all the less dense material that did not go into the core that rose to the surface formed the crust in a very heterogeneous single mode chemical composition of crust. And so this crust formed, and then when plate tectonics started occurring, meaning this crust was broken up into plates and subduction and divergence began occurring, this caused the recycling of plates to begin, and this caused crustal differentiation, meaning mafic oceanic crust and felsic continental crust to start differentiating from each other. So really the reason this happened was that this recycling of plates caused partial melting of that heterogeneous magma that formed that first primordial oceanic crust, led to incompatible elements being pushed out of the crystal structures that were forming from the magma. Typically, mafic crystal structures were pushing out incompatible elements, which caused silica-rich materials to be pushed out and form pods, if you will, of continental crust or silica-rich and less dense crustal islands, if you will. And then the oceanic crust was being purified meaning being made more mafic by the fact that those less mafic materials were incompatible after partial melting and being pushed out. So in short, the oceanic crust and the continental crust differentiated themselves from each other and became two separate things, we think around 4.4 billion years ago. Moving on to the Archean, the Archean eon went from 4 billion years ago, just after the Hadean, to 2.5 billion years ago. During this eon, plate tectonics was faster compared to today because Earth was a lot hotter, and this caused a lot of those continental crust pods to accrete to each other because plate tectonics were moving, they'd eventually collide, and then this, these collisions would cause accretion of these pods together, uh, similar to how I explained in the solar system video how Plam's decimals accreted to form planets, kind of like this, all these little continental pods accreted to form larger continents. And what formed in the Archean was a continent called Laurentia. This continent, actually, we can still see material from today, and how it formed is shown here on the left, and we can see that it was just a bunch of accretion events. Basically, oceanic crust in between continental pods would subduct until those continental pods were accreted together, and this formed this larger Laurentia continent, which we can see on the right as to today's continental configuration shows as a craton. I define craton in my Interpreting Ancient Tectonic Environments video, so if you want to learn more about cratons, you can look there, but basically all of the brown blob here is Precambrian material that's been relatively stable for quite a while now in Earth's history, meaning not tectonically active. However, the green band was actually accreted on to this continental mass much later and in much more incremental events. Similar to the process of accretion we see on the left, this green band accreted in a similar way to the tectonically inactive and stable craton, except all of this accretion occurred after 600 million years ago, so relatively recent when we're talking about Precambrian versus non-Precambrian. But what I really love about the Archean, not that tectonics isn't awesome, but it's life. The evolution of life on Earth is thought to have occurred during the Archean, which is an incredibly long time ago. And the leading theories about how life evolved typically involve hydrothermal vents. And here's a picture of one to the right. This is a black smoker, basically a hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the ocean. These vents are just systems where heat from the mantle is venting into the ocean and causing a bunch of mantle constituents to come up into the ocean and mix with the ocean, forming these crazy smoky chimney type structures. And we used to think that this was such a hot and inhospitable environment that nothing could survive near these vents. But we were wrong. Life is actually thriving in and around these hydrothermal vents. And it's incredible to see the type of ecosystems and the biodiversity that these vents host. And it's all about redox. And so that brings us to how the first life on Earth was likely metabolizing. I talk about redox in my redox stratification video and how different metabolisms use different redox pathways. But here, I just want to point out that the difference in chemistry between the ambient ocean water and the material that spews out of these chimneys 
kidneys causes a wonderful energy difference or redox difference for organisms to take advantage of. And when they take advantage of chemical redox differences to metabolize, this is called chemosynthesis. There's always been debate on whether chemosynthesizing organisms or photosynthesizing organisms were first to evolve on Earth. And I don't know if that is answered or will ever be answered, but basically photosynthesis, we all know, is when organisms get energy from light to do their metabolism. However, chemosynthesizers, if we think that life evolved at hydrothermal vents, are, were likely first to evolve because down deep in the ocean where these hydrothermal vents are occurring, there is no light. So you would have to have chemosynthesizing organisms evolve first. And these could include things such as methanogens and sulfate reducing bacteria, which I also discussed in the redox video. So that's just a little bit about how life might have evolved during the Archean. And now let's move on to other events in the Archean because Again, this was a 1.5 billion year time interval. We have a lot that occurred. So cyanobacterial mats, which formed stromatolites, pictured here on the right, modern and ancient, were microbial mats formed by cyanobacteria, which are organisms that carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. And these were the first oxygenic photosynthesizers to become ubiquitous on Earth, and they caused free oxygen to first start building up in Earth's atmosphere which was huge for biological evolution down the road. As we know, currently, as you all watch this, you are breathing in oxygen that started with these wonderful microorganisms that started producing oxygen. And this is because if you remember, we were talking about the Hadean atmosphere and the outgassing of volcanoes, and we talked about how there wasn't any oxygen, or at least what there was was negligible. And so this explains why oxygenic photosynthesis was so invaluable in terms of allowing oxygen breathing life to evolve. And because of the oxygen buildup in the atmosphere, this caused something else that was significant that occurred around this time, such as BIFs. BIFs stand for bended iron formations, which are just alternating layers of oxidized iron with non-oxidized chert. And these formations indicate to us when oxygen became abundant enough on Earth to oxidize iron, and they are a huge piece of evidence for the oxygen buildup in the atmosphere, which we call the Great Oxidation Event during around the late Archean, early Proterozoic. And if you want to know more about BIFs and how they indicate oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and oceans, you can go watch my Great Oxidation Event video, and it talks way more about that. But I'd like to move on now to the Proterozoic Eon, because when we talk about this great oxidation event, it was actually early Proterozoic. Ever since we realized that cyanobacteria evolved and became ubiquitous and caused this oxidation event of Earth, we have accumulated more and more lines of evidence that point to the timing and intensity of this oxidation event. And so the most recent estimates of when it actually occurred was actually around 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago. So that is definitely in the early Proterozoic. Now, moving into the Proterozoic, I just mentioned that cyanobacteria cause dramatic atmospheric composition change. And this isn't only because free oxygen or oxygen tube built up in the atmosphere, but also that it oxygenated a lot of other compounds in the atmosphere, on our surface, in our oceans, etc. because there were a lot of reduced compounds to oxidize, which actually is what happened with the iron within the BIF formations. And so I talk more about those reduced compounds and the oxidation of those in terms of chemical sinks in the Great Oxidation State video. However, here I want to once again emphasize that organisms began to evolve due to this atmospheric composition change to tolerate the new abundance of O2 in the atmosphere and oceans. Now, I say tolerate here, very important, because the organisms up until this point were not accustomed to oxygen. It was a waste product. It was toxic to a lot of the organisms that were living during this time, and nobody had yet evolved to use it. So what they had to evolve to first is to tolerate it. Once this occurred, further evolution could occur and cause organisms to actually begin to thrive off the free oxygen, meaning they finally evolved to respirate using the oxygen. 
region, which caused huge energy advantages and a huge explosion of a larger and more complex life due to the energy yield advantages of using oxygen respiration over other respiration pathways. And so the first instance that we see this big explosion of larger and more complex life occurring is in the Ediacaran. The Ediacaran is actually a time period within the late Proterozoic or the Neoproterozoic around 600 million years ago. And during this time, we find a lot of soft-bodied organisms in the rock record that, although pretty simple compared to everything that happened in the Cambrian explosion, which I'll get to in a second, they are still very large and complex compared to life before them. And so this is what I mean by complex. We always have to keep it in a relative sense. Before them, life was pretty much single cellular, not complex. Energy pathways were not yielding enough energy to cause super complex functions in these organisms. And so it wasn't until the Ediacaran time period in which we see this fauna, which we call the Ediacaran fauna, evolve and begin being preserved in the rock record. And we're very lucky we even have these records of these organisms during the Ediacaran because although they're more complex, they don't really have hard parts. Again, they're soft bodied. And if you've seen the fossil preservation video that I made, you know that hard parts are very important for preservation. So we are very lucky that we have these records of the soft bodied organisms that mark the Ediacaran fauna. However, immediately following the Ediacaran and the fauna associated with that time interval, we have the Cambrian explosion. So you can see on this time scale, again, I put the same one up as before, we have the Great Oxidation event, which I had up there before, and then the Cambrian explosion itself at around 542 million years ago. And this Cambrian explosion, right after the Ediacaran fauna evolved, marked even more complex life to form, and this life now had hard parts, and it was so different than anything in the Precambrian, including the Ediacaran fauna, that we marked it as a totally new era in Earth history called the Paleozoic, and the period is called the Cambrian, which is why it's called the Cambrian Explosion. But the question I want to pose to you, which I also pose in my Great Oxidation Event video, is why did it take so long after the Great Oxidation Event for this explosion of life to occur? Because it seems like we're relating it to oxygen content, right? I mean, the oxygen respiration pathway allowed this life to become more complex because of greater energy yields. And so the reason that I want to point out is this. So we see here that the Great Oxidation event only raised oxygen levels to about 10% of today's levels, although an enormous event compared to early Earth, and it did change Earth's atmospheric composition forever and Earth systems as a whole forever, and therefore a very important event in Earth's history. It did, however, only raise it to 10% of today's levels, and therefore we had the second huge oxidation event occurred later on, just before the Cambrian. And this is why we had the Cambrian explosion. That second push of oxygen, for some reason, was what led to that huge explosion of complex oxygen-breathing life. So now moving on to a little bit about the tectonics during the Proterozoic, because we talked in the Hadean about crustal formation, but what's happening with the crust now? We know that the oceanic crust and continental crust differentiated, and then we talked about how during the Archean, Laurentia formed. But what's happening with the continental and oceanic crust and plate tectonics during the Proterozoic? Well, we had a couple supercontinents form, and you might be thinking two whole different supercontinents formed in one time interval in Earth's history. Well, yeah, but keep in mind that the Proterozoic Eon is 2.5 billion years ago to 540 million years ago. So that is over 2 billion years of Earth's history counted in one eon. So it had a lot of time for continental configurations to change and plate tectonics to take place. So the first supercontinent to form was Rodinia around 1 billion years ago. Later in the late Proterozoic, around 550 million years ago, just before the Cambrian or even during the early Paleozoic around the Cambrian, Ordovician, etc., we had the formation of Gondwana or at least the beginnings of the formation of Gondwana during the late Proterozoic. And so these were the two main continental configuration events that were occurring during the Paleozoic. Lastly, and somewhat related to the continental configurations of Earth during the Proterozoic, we had the first ice ages, which occurred during the Proterozoic. And these occurred around 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago, and then again around 800 to 600 million years ago. The first one was caused by, was caused by the Great
brain oxidation event. So all the oxygen being produced by the cyanobacteria was coupled with the uptake of carbon dioxide by cyanobacteria. And this rapid decrease in greenhouse gases caused an ice age event, the first one in Earth's history, at least to our knowledge. And then around 800 to 600 million years ago, way later during the late Neoproterozoic, we have evidence for an even more extensive ice age, which was actually so extensive, we have evidence for glaciers on continents that would have been near the equator during that time. So that indicated to us that it was almost a snowball earth event, meaning the entire earth covered in ice. And so this was really significant and is still really significant because you would expect that everything would go extinct with no hydrologic activity. However, since we made the proposal of the snowball earth, researchers have found more recent evidence to suggest maybe a more slush ball earth. Yes, I know scientists come up with the best names, but this slush ball earth hypothesis has come to light because the evidence for snowball earth or a completely ice ball earth where hydrologic activity was halted is just not great enough. We would have had more detrimental effects on biological evolution. And there's a lot of other evidence that I am not an expert in, so I'm not going to like go on about it, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests slush ball rather than snowball. So not completely all ice, basically. And I'm going to talk more about ice ages and glacial history, as well as glacial depositional environments and how to recognize ancient glacial events in my glacial depositional environments video. So if you want to know more about that, I will be talking about that there. And for this video, that is all. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned a little bit about some major events that occurred during the Precambrian, how and when life evolved, at least to our best knowledge currently. And I hope you come back for the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic videos of this Earth's History playlist. So thanks again for joining me and I'll see you all next time. Bye!